Thank you. My first question, Tatiana, could you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Oh, great. This is... So, I, I, walking in there, I just realized two things. I'm, f I'm, I'm following a speaker who was... Oh, hi. There's a lot of people I know here. Um, I'm following a speaker who was very energetic and had a better haircut than me. Um, so, and it's also, it's actually one of my first speeches I made since January 2020 when COVID hit. So, I'm honored to be here. Um, so, we will try to do this a little bit interactive. I'm supposed to give you some thoughts, and then hopefully Tatiana will ask me some hard questions, and I would like you to join me to ask me questions as well. I'm, I'm well known for speaking fast in any language, um, and I don't like to speak at length. So, I hope, you can, we can, I hope we can make it more interactive. Is that okay? Hi, by the way. It's so good to see people again. I missed you. Anyway. ICANN. Uh, my name is Jorah Morbi. I'm the president and CEO of ICANN. And, and as you know, ICANN sort of have two different roles. One of them is what many of you are engaged in, is the policy-making process. That is actually not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the other thing we do, which is actually our technical remit, what we, what we actually do from a technical standpoint. The reason for that is because that is what often is now is getting challenged by governments and regulations around the world. So think about it like this. Every time you go online as an individual, you hit about something that originates from ICANN. All identifiers and all protocols technically starts at ICANN. That's our role. That's why we created it. We don't set policies for all of this, of course. Um, we have, for instance, RIPE, who sets policies for uh, the distribution from IP addresses. You have all the country code operators who sets their own policies, how to utilize their assets for that. But we do that technically. And, and that's quite important uh, to bear in mind that that is the sort of a role I'm talking about today. It, it's kind of interesting because that is the fact that we all join by the hip, but one technical system creates something that is quite unique, the interoperability of the internet itself. Today we have, I don't know how even they calculate it, we have about 5 billion internet users around the world. It's quite, with all using the same interoperable system. Someone told me that, I think it was in uh, November 2020, it was the largest internet day ever, with more than 8 trillion requests into the system at one day. I, I invited researchers and other ones to tell me why that was the biggest internet day ever, because we actually don't know, uh, because nobody has the control of what actually happens on the internet. But it says something about the volume of this interoperability. It's funny, sort of, I started working for ICANN in 2016 or 200 internet years ago. When I joined ICANN, everything about the internet was positive. Do you remember those days? It's going to save the world. Peace to the world, good digital economy, everything was positive. All countries came up with digital plans to make the country more digital, and then everything's just going to work out. And then I went to a conference in Geneva, and everybody's talking about the negative effects of the internet. And it happened very fast. It was not really like, I remember me and a guy called Windsurf that you might have heard of. We were sitting on a panel and we just looked at each other. Why are everybody so negative now? It was all about fake news, frauds, and very important things. But suddenly it just became negative. Until that day, many of us who were engaged in this worked in a very close environment with no political interest to it. But it was fairly natural that at one point we will see politicians and governments, for good reason, to stand up and say that we see that the internet has changed society. But the interesting thing is, of course, that they start looking at what they can do better with it. And here are some of the problems, George. Because first, one of the things they often don't realize is that the difference between, which I think that the previous speaker spoke about as well, the difference between the internet and platforms. When you walk into a platform, uh, social media platforms, other platforms, you physically leave the internet. The internet is a transport for you to get into a platform. When you come into a platform, you're in someone else's computer. And that, whoever designed that computer is now controlling everything you do. And there are large social media platforms out there with a lot of users, but it's not the internet itself. Can we agree on that? Yes. Can you, every time you meet someone, tell the difference between a social media platform and the internet itself? It helped me greatly. Also, it explained to me that the word cyber doesn't exist. 
Cyber is always in someone else's computer, and cloud computing is nothing else that you placed your things in your neighbor's garage in their computers. It's, it is that simple. There's no magic in about it. So when people started, and from a geopolitical standpoint, when politicians start, and I think they, they, they are right. I mean, most countries are on a good democratic scale, and what they do is that they look at things that they don't like and try to regulate it. Here comes the first problem. Internet, internet, as I now define it, outside the platforms, doesn't have anything to do with country borders. You know that by instinct, because it's an interoperable system, networks of networks working together, all, the, all of us working together to produce what we call the internet. How do you regulate that? In the EU, you've seen certain attempts trying to make a digital sovereignty by talking about that we have to build resources in our own region. I applaud the idea behind it, but it still doesn't work if you actually think that you can regulate something that is interoperable around the world. Today, fragmentation of the internet actually doesn't exist. And I can prove that with about 5 billion users around the world all connected to the same system. But there's a risk for it, and that's why I'm here today. I believe that the multi-stakeholder model has proven over decades to be the, the real perfect way of regulating or managing or govern uh, the internet core identifier system. Why do I think that? Because we went from zero users to five billion users in a couple of decades. And the system has not gone down in 35 years. You never think about the fact that the internet itself will go down. Your ISP might go down, your Wi-Fi might go down, your mobile phone might go down, but the central system hasn't failed in 35 years. So what we're doing from a multi stakeholder perspective is we are inherited very much of the ICANN bylaws and all the partners we have here to engage now with politicians, legislators around the world to have the conversation. We believe, for instance, privacy is important. We believe intellectual property rights are important. Do regulation for that, but don't do anything that actually hurts the actual internet itself. I often talk about, we often think about the, the sort of the geopolitical effects on internet on some bad regimes wants to do something with internet, and we have them. I mean, in the, um, in the election for ITU, Secretary General right now, Russia has been very open on the fact that they run on a platform to be the Secretary General uh, to take over ICANN, RIPE, and everybody else under the UN umbrella. We don't think that's a good idea, by the way. We have close relationship with ITU. Uh, we are colleagues rather than thinking that governments should manage the core of the internet going forward. What I really want is, this message I want to send for you is not, it's not the bad actors we're after. It's actually the, the, the road to hell is paid with good intentions. Because what we see are legislat legislative proposals around the world from friendly countries. It's just that they don't always understand the difference between what happens on a platform and how it will affect the interoperability of the internet. I will stop there and hope you have some questions as well. And I feel energized to actually standing on the stage talking again, despite that I have to do something about my haircut. Tatiana, I know that you also have to leave at a certain point in time. You should also know that Tatiana and I are old friends, and since we met the first time, she asked very hard questions to me. Uh, thank you very much, Joran. And indeed, I must say that I'm worried about my haircut as well. Nobody can be as cool as a um, previous speaker in terms of haircuts. But I do have a couple of hard questions to you. Oh, I don't know if it's hard or not. So uh, you said that we have to deliver a message uh, to various policymakers and broader community that Facebook is not the internet, that platforms are different from the core of the internet. And that made me thinking, basically what you're talking about is the threat to the technical layer of the internet, but also to the way internet is governed, the multi-stakeholder manner, right? So we know that ICANN is one of the very few examples of this function in multi-stakeholder models with frameworks for accountability, transparency, good governance, uh, protections against capture, frameworks that have been being developed for the last like two decades, right? This model is very complex exactly because of this accountability, transparency, protections, fiduciary duties, and so on and so forth. But I doubt that policymakers actually get it. I doubt that policymakers actually get the beauty of this model. And I think that 
In addition to saying how internet is working technically, don't you think it would be also good to increase legitimacy of this governance by promoting it? Don't you think, in addition to explaining the differences between platform and the internet, it would be also good to go out and explain how multi-stakeholder model works and why it's good? So, I mean, ICANN does that and Wright does that. Um, ITF is doing the same thing. Um, but I also think that the, I mean, ICANN as an, we, I mean, ICANN as an institution, all of them are, we have a good brand and we can, you know, we can speak to people. But I also think that it's important that in every country and every region you represent, um, you have the same story. I think that for, 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 for a period of time, I think that a lot of people took internet governance and things like ICANN for granted. You know, we, we sort of, yeah, it's working, I mean, what's the problem? And, and look at it, you could say that we have 5 billion users, we still should have 10 billion users around the world, especially in Africa, parts of Asia, uh, and parts of Latin America. Um, we, we, we see that there's not enough internet users around the world. We're not done. The fact that the, I can't, I mean, the internet itself or the DNS is still very much, to say it bluntly, uh, sort of English in its presence, uh, where we use Latin script, reading from left to right using a dot. Uh, prohibits the next generation of internet users come in. We have a lot of work to do. But the whole model is not, the, the multi-stakeholder model is a way to achieve the goals of making sure that ICANN and all the other organizations in this stay core to its mission and also making decisions. But I think that one thing we have to realize is that internet is global, but it's also local. And the localities often are the country code operators or the top of the domain operators in the country. In the country are often better spokesmen for this model than I am, uh, because you're part of a society to see it. I just think that we should not reach the point where we actually forgot about the importance of the interoperability of the internet, because someone comes around and says, oh, 5G is really good. 5G is so good for everything. It solves every problem. Any mobile operator here, is I will just stamp on their feet for a while. Um, because. 5G suddenly, who wants to terminate all traffic in a mobile cloud, which means that they come to decide upon which kind of internet you will have. Or the new IP coming from China, uh, or from Huawei, sorry, uh, which is, is not about a new technology at all, it's actually, I'm an old nerd, so it's like ATM. Anyone old enough to remember ATM? Oh, please, thank you. I felt very old. X25, you remember that as well? I mean, it's, I f oh, great. Yeah, I'm old. Uh, but it's actually about the governance model uh, to change how people make decisions on the big governance of the internet. And if we don't take those fights, there is a possibility that we will have a fragmentation of the internet, which we actually don't have today. We have a layer. We have social media platforms, large platforms, on top of what we call the identifier system. So we need to do a better job, Tatiana. That's the honest answer. But we have to work together to do it. Yes, Joran. Uh, just a follow-up. I'm sorry, but I'm going to dwell on it a bit. Uh, if I may challenge you, right? Uh, so what, what you were talking about, this locality, these communities, it is, it is technical and governance together, right? But what I feel when I go out to these localities, to these communities, or to this you know, globality of governance, I always feel that there is actually a lack of understanding exactly because the multi-stakeholder model is so complex. Look at people who come to ICANN, for example, for the first time. It takes ages to understand the complexity of these mechanisms and how this works. And I absolutely agree with you that the message sent to the policymakers, to the people in government should be aligned. But who should channel this, channel this message? Do you think that ICANN.org and ICANN community should have sort of more proactive approach in increasing this legitimacy? Because just by saying multi-stakeholder model, we are not making it bigger or sweeter or more accepted. We have to make a case for this because a few weeks ago, I was following the OEWG, Open-Ended in, in, open Working Group on the Cybersecurity, right, right International Security of the United Nations. And it was all over the place about giving control over, uh, over internet to the multilateral model, to the government, governments. 
and and these governments, these people are saying, yeah, this is governed by private sector some some way in the United States. Let's take it back. Who will break this message? Who will deliver the fact that it's not a private sector really? That this is multi-stakeholder. How do we increase this legitimacy? Is ICANN going to be more proactive? Well, we tried to do it, but can you still hear me? Because it's, it's yes. no fun to stand behind this one. I got bored. Um, so, two weeks ago, uh, under US government, 61 or 62 countries signed a declaration uh, about the internet. And in that, there are writings about what, what is uh, the, the importance of, of maintaining ICANN and other multi-stakeholder models to govern the internet. Was it 60 or 62 countries that actually signed it on? What we need, all of us, is actually, because ICANN, we are a member of the ITUD, uh, but we, we cannot speak. It's only governments who can speak there. So what we need to do there uh, is to work with governments. The governments actually defend us there. Other things we're working on is to make sure that there are no trade agreements between countries, which are very, very important, that there are notions about uh, the internet and how to, to, to manage the internet in the, trade, uh, in the trade agreements again, which is one of the things that was said for the countries who actually signed on this declaration, that what they're going to do, use it for is for trade, for trade agreements, which is just they're really the best. That's the way countries actually regulate between themselves is through trade agreements. Um, and you know how political sensitive they can be as well. But it, but it is a good point. But it's, I think it's also time to realize it's not ICANN, it's not RIPE, it's not ITF. It's all of us together. I mean, you are representing top-level domain operators, CSIS and other ones here. This is something we have to do together. Uh, because otherwise we will, might, you know, we will, like, sometimes we take democracy for granted. If we don't fight it for every day, we will lose it in the end. And I think that's... So one of the you know, more important things for us to do now after COVID is to ch not challenge uh, good legislators and politicians around the world, but actually work with them how this system actually works. You know better than most that internet is a, it is an amazing technology. I mean, it's built up in such a way that nobody controls it. You know that we, re we received questions about, uh, for instance, the situation in Ukraine. And people believe that you can come to ICANN and we can change something. That's not how it works. It's delegated in that system that when we actually delegate something, someone else is in charge for that delegation. And it's purposely made up, sometimes a little bit by chance, uh, we're able to use this technology from you know, zero users to five million users. But it's a very fixed box. And if you, if you sort of mess with this box, you will actually disconnect people from the internet. We have seen legislative proposals, also here in the EU, that you actually read the text says that people will actually be automatically disconnected from the internet. In, in one of the proposals a couple of years ago, it was about cookies. Well, they said that, when I, they sort of said that the user, and I'm paraphrasing now, uh, when they said that the user has to accept the cookie before connection could be made. Yeah. It's a little bit hard to accept uh, a cookie before the communication is made because then you don't have the communication and you don't actually have something to say yes to. And, and we, we have to work with that. And we've seen other proposals like that as well. But my, again, my aim is actually to engage with you because you have better contacts to do this. Uh, so I'm agreeing with you, too. Yeah. Can't you uh, have a question? Anyone else have a question, by the way? No one? Don't be shy. Joran, I'm going to intervene here because being mindful of the time, right, and the fact that I have to run soon in eight minutes, basically. I am going to ask one question and then leave you and the audience, whom I'm going to say Hesley and Dunk, to engage in a, in a conversation on site. But I want to follow up. I think I really have, have, you have a point here. You do have a point and I'm very much satisfied with your answer, but I want to dig a bit deeper here about the government's so the declaration on the future of internet. We had so many declarations in this, in this world, you know, politically. We have universal declaration on the human rights, which, you know, has, has been just that. It has been declaration. And at the same time, when you talk about government signing this declaration about protecting ICANN, about multi-stakeholder model and governance, we see all these regulatory initiatives coming all around the globe, including the EU. So I want to follow up and again, uh, get, get us back to ICANN a bit. Because as far as I understand, we are bringing together here ICANN, you, 
um, and geopolitical trends. So in the ICON model, the, act, the governments are actually participating, right? They are a part of governmental advisory committee. So it is my understanding that those who are drafting the regulations that can potentially affect ICON and the multi-stakeholder model of governance are often not the same people who come to ICON and work with the GAC, work at ICON. So, in your opinion, and this is my last question, and then really you can open the floor and ask people, I will say goodbye. So my last question is, do you think that uh, the, the, this participation of government at ICANN can be leveraged, actually, um, can be leveraged to better convey the message about ICANN, to, uh, about the beauty and legitimacy of multi-stakeholder model within the governments, because it seems to me that these departments do not speak to each other. And while declarations remain declarations, regulation will affect us all. So do you think ICANN can leverage participation of the governments at GAC and make these departments talking together, talking to each other better? And can we as a community facilitate this anyhow? I mean, the, the GAC, I mean, to have the GAC in, inside ICANN is a really positive thing because we have 170 countries that signed up. Uh, they also signed up for uh, the ICANN model uh, in, in the so-called transition 2016. Yes, you point to the fact that not all governments is always well coordinated within the government. Probably not a risk here in Germany, but in, you know, in Sweden there is. Um, and, and, and it's a problem. I mean, here in, the, here in Europe, you also have this specific uh, ambition by the European Commission to, to, to do this sovereignty, uh, which I, you know, first of all, I applaud in many ways, uh, but I don't always agree with the proposals they're coming up with. So we are working together with the GAC um, to actually, and I did that yesterday, we do more and more training sessions of GAC members uh, so they can have that. And, and while I'm here in Germany, I have the honor to, to work with, together with the GAC representative to meet members uh, of the government as well. So we do that more and more. So I don't want to disagree with you. But again, uh, when we come into the next ICANN meeting, which will happen in The Hague, one of the interesting things for you guys is that you can actually walk into the GAC room and you can meet your country's GAC representatives and have a conversation with them as well. I often spoke to, to different constituencies within ICANN and said, this is an opportunity. You will meet them at the reception, you will meet them at the cocktail, get to know them. Because they often want to carry your message back. And if there's something, they actually have to because they're government representatives. But they cannot speak if the government hasn't decided what they can talk, what they can say. And that is something that is different from all other parts, is that if you represent a government going into the GAC, your government has told you what to say. And if the government hasn't told you to say anything, basically, you can't say anything, because it's never your personal opinion if you represent the country. And that is something we have to work on. But I, again, um, we are you know, trying to, to train GAC members more and more. Um, but the second thing is, open the door and go in and talk to them. Uh, thank you very much, Joran. I see uh, someone, is, someone has a hand up there. Thank God. Uh, before, bef before this person asks their question, maybe I can say goodbye, because I really have to run and talk to my students about platform regulation. Good. And I believe that you will handle this discussion in the room in the best possible way. Thank you very much for answering all my questions, and I hope to see you soon. You still owe me an answer on local loop unbundling, you know. See yeah, you. yeah we, we still have not solved the local loop unbundling. Bye-bye. Thank you very much to Danik for inviting me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We have some questions. I'm offline, but I'm going to be... Oh, I do. there I we are. One, yes, please. One question. So I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, I don't see it happening. And I think we have an opportunity to do that better now than we did with the GDPR, for example. You know, I see a lot of know your customer regulations coming from CCTLD registries under a lot of pressure from their governments. And so now is the time. Like, are we going to do something within the ICANN community, within the CCTLD community to really address this before it just gets dumped on us? Or are we just going to talk about it and watch as it, you know, the train comes towards us? I mean, Frank, is it okay if I move around with some engineers? Because of course. It, to stand behind there, I feel like a politician. And I, <laughs> believe me, no one would vote for me to an elected office anywhere. So GDPR is a good example. Um, 
yeah, ICANN and everybody was late when the G implementation of GDPR. We can all agree on that one. But we can also agree upon the GDPR, the WHOIS system uh, was a roadkill. Uh, the, the, there was unintended consequence of the WHOIS system. And it was funny, when I started engaged with the European Commission about it and told, told them, yeah, what's going to happen is that we have to not disclose all Huawei's data, they looked at me like, what do you mean? Because they never anticipated, if you, if you look through the, the paper they have wrote, together with the legislation, the word Huawei is, is not there. So it was not only us, sort of us as a community failed, it was also, I would say, the European Union and the European Commission. And then we, we've been working on that. Um, and, and for you who are representing other top-level domain operators and CCs here, whatever we come up with will also have an effect on you. That, that's sort of how, how this becomes, because they're not going to make a difference between top-level operators. So I agree with you. And we still, because of the fact that there were unintended consequences when it came to the Huawei system, uh, we're still working through that. Um, and just, there is another letter coming from me to the, to the protection authorities and the EU again to provide more clarifications about some of the things in this law. I used to be a telecom regulator. I shouldn't say this. Don't. We all know. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm very happy I'm not the one who regulates this, uh, this law. It's not an easy law to regulate. And it's not an easy law to follow either. And that's the truth. Anyone who claims that they are experts on GDPR, I usually say, yeah, thank you very much. Um, but it's a very good example. So to give you some of the positive examples, so. In the NIS2 legislation, for instance, the Commission proposed that they want to regulate actually all the way down to IANA. The, um, and together, we actually stopped that. Um, they wanted to have reports written and inside information already publicly available, by the way. Um, and, and we thought it was important enough uh, to take that. And together with RIPE and the community, we were able to change the legislative proposal. Also in NIS2, there are other uh, other things um, in Article 23, I think it is, that we have given direct proposals how to change that legislation as well. All this, what I'm saying, is actually open on the... Uh, uh, you can find that information on our web pages as well. So I agree, there are more things we could do. But it's not only I can, we have to do it together. I can give you many more examples. I mean, one of the interesting things you've seen from the... which we don't really interfere with, is the proposal for a resolver uh, for Europe, where the European Commission came out with uh, saying that Google and Cloudflare or someone had 95 or 98% market share, which surprised us slightly because, in essence, they have a 2.5% market share, um, and the rest of the resolvers belongs to telcos and ISPs. Um, yeah. A lot of things to be do there. More questions, please. We don't really have the time. You, you answered two questions in one, by the way. Well done. OK. Um, and the problem is our next speaker has a tight schedule, and she's going to join us remote. So okay. oh. um, will you be around for a little while longer? Um, no, you have to A little leave. bit longer, li but mm -hmm. I'm fine. So Thank you. you. You gave me shorter time. Did we? Yes, no. because this previous We are 10 minutes longer now, and you started 10 minutes late. Thank oh, you. I don't want to be the bad cop here. Is there another question? There's I would have someone had standing some. up there. Okay, let's do it. Is it a short one? Give it to us. Oh, um, I hear a lot the word we have to fight for something. And unfortunately, right now, in, in the current situation, this word fight is being used in, with terrible consequences. And I think we should avoid using this. We should use different metaphors. And one of them that is, I think is useful is to build rather than to fight. And there's many things that we need to build. Specifically, you know, in the context of who is, we need to build new things, and possibly not by legislation, but making th people, you know, enabling, to use, enabling them to use things rather than obliging them to use things. I mean, I take your comments about not using the word fight. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> but I still, still think that we have an obligation to protect the interoperability of the internet and the transparency of the internet. So just add on to the WIS. WIS has actually been around longer than I can. It's a part of the transparency of the internet uh, that we always believed in. GDPR hindered that transparency. People discussed the different effects, if it was good or bad. 
But the fact of the matter is when GDPR came around, it, it lessened the transparency of the internet itself. Um, and that's not something we, as I can, or anyone else can do something about. That's up to the legislators. And so far, they have not been willing to change the law to give who is uh, broader access. It is, uh, we have to do what we have to do when it comes to disclosure of data. With that, I'm done. That was short, wasn't I it? Had, I had questions as well. You but had a question? Uh, then, no, but we don't have the time for it. I, I'm really, s yeah. Are there any threats to ICANN's role at the moment? Like, I was thinking about ITU, the new Secretary General, stuff coming up. Well, this, <laughs> let's not use the word threats. <laughs> I'm learning. Um, <laughs> Challenges. There's always challenges. I yeah. mean, there are countries around the world who doesn't, doesn't really like the model, the multi-stakeholder model. Mm -hmm. They like to uh, have a more govern governments interfering into it. And, and then I, when they tell me, I usually give one example, then I'm going to be silent. So what I can on all of those do is actually very effective. And I know this because I've been the head of my country delegation to ITU. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one example. It took the UN system 25 years to come up with what we call the international sea law. It took 25 years for countries to agree on this one. What we do in the multi stakeholder model, that's what we do for breakfast. <laughs> so you might think it takes a long time, but actually, if you look comparison on our, how reactive we can be for a challenge, when we come together, it's much faster than any governments. And it's also, I think it's important that we don't only listen to elected officials. I want to have civil society there. I want to have businesses there. I want to have academia there. I want the elected ones as well. Because who are we actually doing this for? We're not doing this for business. We're not for profit, for God's sake. We do it for one reason. We want people to have access to internet. Mm -hmm. And the reason we want to do that is not because we make any money of it, it's just that we believe when people get access to internet, something magical happens. What is this? It's up to you.